Sabu and Abyss. It's awesome. These guys are physically incapable of not having a fantastic match against each other. So I like I remember when we were getting up to Genesis, I got a message that was like, just you wait. <laughs> just you wait. <laughs> You're gonna get Sabu and Abyss again in another sleeper hit. And I was like, alright, let's go. And we got there and I was like, yes. Would you like me to make you a little mad before we go into the bill for this match? Sure. Dave Meltzer gave Sabu and Abyss the rating of one and a half stars. I mean, yeah, but he gives like an edge ladder match 10 stars, so what the fuck does he know? <laughs> there is a little bit of it where he's like moralizing about Eddie Guerrero, and he's like... Oh, shut the fuck up! Yeah, where he's like, Eddie died, and these guys are doing thumbtack spots for no reason that aren't even finishes, and I'm like, dude, shut up. Like, shut up! <laughs> like, shut the fuck up! Mm. <laughs> October 29th Impact, Abyss faces Lance Hoyt in a rematch of their pay-per-view match. Great, I'm so, I'm, so, I'm so happy to see this match again. Their pay-per-view match was great. This one was fine. Yeah, but I'm sick of seeing the same matches over and over and over You just again. hate Lance Hoyt now. I do kind of hate Lance Hoyt now. Abyss hit a chokeslam, Mitchell slid in a chair, Hoyt booted the chair into Abyss's face, but then Mitchell pulled Hoyt off. Uh, Abyss hit the black hole slam for the win. He got some tacks, but the lights went out. As they came back on, Sabu was running into position, so he wasn't quite there. He was like, ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> I was just thinking, you know, it would have been fun what? if when Hoyt debuted in AEW, instead of Jack the Snack, he had James Mitchell as his uh, manager. Yeah, it's a shame that, like, Mitchell still pops up at Impact every now and again doing Undead Realm st stuff. But, like, it's crazy to me that, like, when this run ended, no one else was like, we need to get James Mitchell in here right now. Mm. Yeah, this is, like, his, like, only big run in modern yeah, like, the only other, like, he, he manages Max the Impaler in the NWA. That's, like, the only other, like, thing. But this is his only major run in the modern era. Yeah. That's, like, why are you, why aren't we hiring James Mitchell? I guess because WWE were on top for so long and they hate managers, I think. is, is that... He also probably, I can imagine he's, like, not super pumped travel a lot. He's doing his wedding DJ stuff, mm. which is wild to think. <laughs> on AEW television. Yeah. <laughs> I'd, oh yeah, he would like. I do like the canonical. The Sinister Minister is in fact the because he he went right off the the Johnny Bravo wedding into doing that as well. So it was just like, yes, he is the the minister. He is overseeing these weddings. He, he should do every wrestling wedding. He should. It should be one of those things where every time there's a wrestling wedding, it's just Father James. Do you think we'll ever get another AW wedding angle? I think so. Like wedding angles are the kind of thing that like people might think are too sports entertainmenty, but like nah, they're just wrestling staples. I don't think we're gonna get it again, just because I think it feels a little too far away from what a modern AEW would do. I feel like it fits very, like, tightly into what they were, like, trying to, like, you know, keep things interesting and different during the pandemic era, but I can't imagine them doing one in front of, like, a full arena. Or an 80% full arena. <laughs> or, well, based on some arenas, maybe a little less than 80. There's no reason for us to take these shots. They're just funny. We were just being petty. <laughs> just to make people mad. Uh, like, TNA had some great weddings. Like, the, the Aces and Eights one where uh, uh, Taz does the, the dramatic turn is very silly. Uh, uh, mm. the, the ODB and Eric Young steel cage wedding where, where Sarita and Rosita come out and attempt to, uh, like, swoon Eric and to steal him away by doing sexy poses. And he has to overcome temptation to, to marry ODB. That's also a good bit. I think weddings are fucking stupid uh there's the laurel van ness wedding which is maybe the best one that one is an unbelievably good segment but i don't know they're they're silly wrestling nonsense i'm on board with weddings nah no 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 weddings in my wrestling no love you don't want love in your wrestling no love is a, love is is all throughout pro wrestling but i don't need a fucking wedding for it <laughs> Sabu comes out, lights out, Sabu is up there, and he pulls off a, a cover over his arm to reveal barbed wire over his <gasps> bloody arm, which because this is Sabu, I'd like to think it's actually shoot blood. Yeah, it's awesome. So he has barbed wire over his arm, and this scares the shit out of Abyss. Abyss cowers away as he'll face Sabu in a no-DQ match, suggesting that uh, despite Abyss being a hardcore crazy person, he does not in fact particularly care for barbed wire. He's scared, canonically. <laughs> Abyss had a large bruise in his leg from where Hardy landed on him from the Swanton Bomb at the pay-per-view and Abyss was knocked out and seeing stars for about 10 seconds uh, even though his leg and not his head took the brunt of the punishment. So he was like, he just took that impact from that height that he was like winded and knocked into like complete like uh, obliviousness for 10 seconds and also had a very large bruise. But still worked TV the next day because Abyss is clearly a trooper. Um, opening match of the primetime special was a six-man tag as we were talking about it. It's Sabu, Lance Hoyt and Jeff Hardy against the Diamonds in the Rough. This match very clearly cut short 
because Sabu hurts his toe or well, hurts his foot. It looks like he hurts his ankle when you're watching it. And uh, then the match ends like literally 30 seconds later. Hardy just hits a swanton and wins. Uh, so clearly Sabu got hurt in this match and they cut it short. So it was a match. He suffered a broken toe as it happened. Yeah. I, listen, I'm not going to complain about it being short. Mm. They replayed Hardy's swanton during his entrance, which you would expect. And they also talked about how the Diamonds in the Rough... <laughs> Tanae is like, the Diamonds in the Rough's confidence level must be at an all-time high after they won one single match. Good bit. They have won one match, and they're doing good. And wordplay, primetime, was in primetime. Mm. That's good wordplay, Garrett. Thank you. Well, Mike Tanae said it, but I'll take credit. <laughs> uh, no, just take fucking credit for it. Abyss hit Sabu with a Black Hole Slam after this match, after the six-man tag. Uh, didn't have anything Sabu-related in the go-home, probably because, again, he was injured, so he's probably meant to be in that main event in the Chris Saban spot, I would guess. But, yeah, uh, he broke his toe, so no. And Abyss comes out and does the title shot stuff. So, James Mitchell on the pay-per-view does a promo with Franchise and Abyss. And Mitchell is like, there is one thing Abyss fears, and it's barbed wire. <laughs> and every time he says barbed wire, Abyss jumps. He's like... <laughs> He doesn't even like the word. He's just like, the, even the word is like, ah. And he's like, we went through years of therapy to get him over this fear of barbed wire because he has some kind of barbed wire related trauma in his past. And he was so close. This is the promo. Like, he's like, we went to therapy. Sitting down with Dr. Stevie, I guess. So to talk through his fear. I'd be way more into this segment. <laughs> if Dr. Stevie was in it. Sadly, he was still employed by WV at that stage. So One day. It was like, we went up to therapy, we were overcoming this trauma, and then you had to come along with your fucking barbed wire and ruin everything. Yeah. So he's like, anyway, Abyss will kill you. And then Abyss takes an egg out and crushes it in his own face to illustrate him crushing Abyss, Abu's brain. He also got the, the yolk all over his mask, which that mask probably smelled of yolk for the rest of the night. <laughs> that was so gross. So then Abyss, Sabu, in a no disqualification match. Uh, yeah, that's awesome. It starts off with the amazing spot of like Sabu having his arm covered again and then he, and then he just takes it off and there's nothing there. Sabu playing mind games. Amazing. Uh, but that distraction does allow Sabu to do what Sabu does, which is fuck a chair at, at Abyss's head. Uh, Sabu hits Abyss with a top roll perk and Rana, which is one of those bumps that Abyss takes. It's like, what? what? You're so big. Why are you taking bumps like this? You are crazy and I love you. Because he's a crazy person. And he always, like, the way like Abyss takes like bumps like that, he always like flips slightly to the side. Again, everything Abyss does, we've talked about this before, but at, like every one of his movements is unlike how you've ever seen anybody move. The way he runs and he charges is awesome. The way he takes like a bump over the ropes and always lands ass first on the apron is awesome. The way like he takes a, a, her, a top rope work on Rana where he like does a weird bump like flip to the side over her. it's like everything Abyss does is unique he's not like any other wrestler as you watch him and more wrestlers should be like that they shouldn't just be doing like the same cookie cutter spots the way you see everybody yeah. else do them when you watch Abyss both like with his moveset and the stuff he does but just the way he moves and just the way every bumps it's different you should feel different well, that's the thing is like bumping differently from everything else is a very, from everyone else is a very easy way to stand out mm. too. Because a lot of people focus on like their mannerisms while doing stuff, but not a lot of people focus on selling differently. So you see someone who does sell like in a very different way that stands out. Yeah, to go through the current extreme, anytime you watch a Darby Allen match, yeah, <laughs> and you see him eat shit on every single move, you're like, that is, you are one of the most compelling wrestlers around. I've been delving around the pervert shoot style scene a little bit lately. Mm -hmm. And Alexander Otska is someone who reminds me of that a lot. Like, he, when he's doing these, he's just getting his ass kicked, and he just, I, he looks like he's being ragdolled by strikes, and it's amazing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> It's, it's one of those things people don't work on that people should work on that you, you're not just taking the same flat backs everybody else is you're not moving the same everybody else is you do do things differently feel different well that's like something you see in like omega too is he takes everything in a very different way than most yeah he's a weird freak you know i'm thinking of people who do this and they're all they're all weird freaks because mm. it's abyss it's darby it's otsuka it's omega it's Osprey. <laughs> it's just a bunch of weird freaks. <laughs> Get more weird freaks in wrestling. <laughs> Preferably weird freaks about their own bodies and not weird freaks in other mm. ways. We have enough of weird freaks in other ways. Sabu slingshots over the ropes and leg drops Abyss through a table on the floor. He goes to use a barbed wire of a chair, but Mitchell hooks it with his cane and takes it away from him. It's a good bit, even though it was kind of fucked up. Yeah, he doesn't quite hook it, he kind of misses, but it's it, it's like, it's enough to interfere with Sabu's rhythm that you're like, okay, it, it just about works. It works enough. Mm. 
Abyss got it, his, his bag of tax, he poured them out, and then hit a spinning choke slam onto Sabu into the tax. That and, and it looks like it looks like an Uranagi. Yeah, he just like choke slams them, turns in the air, and just like boo. Because a regular choke slam isn't enough. That's not gonna get enough thumbtacks in your back. You have to spin them to really get that no. force and momentum going. I really got a Abyss really shut me the fuck up when I was criticizing his his spread of his thumbtacks in this mm. match. <laughs> I was like, they're all in one area. It looks so lame. And then, like, a billion thumbtacks are in Sabu's back. And I'm like, you know what? Shut the fuck up, lame. How about that? <laughs> yeah, because he has a routine, which I think is a, is a character beat as much as anything else. That when he pours... I do too. When he pours thumbtacks, he does do a thing where he, like, spends, like, 20 seconds, like, spreading them and making sure they're just He's right. He's, like, hyper Yeah, and, like, like Tanae always mentions it on commentary that, like, he, get, he gets, like, tunnel vision. That, like, when he's focused on a task, he's like, I have to put my thumbtacks out. Out and do my thumbtacks right. I like to think he sings a little song as he it's, does it. The Abyss character is actually probably way more nuanced than people think. Because <laughs> he always got knocked be, with being like the fake mankind or the fake Kane. And like, no, he's not. No, he's like, there's like levels to the Abyss character. And I think it's because it's not like explicitly said <laughs> to the mm. audience that maybe wrestling fans are too stupid to pick up on it. But like, there's levels to it. Like he is playing the role of monster. Like, he is not just, like, big guy, you know? He's not just... He's, mm. he's actually playing the role of monster. So he's doing the little things you would expect, like, a Frankenstein monster to kind of do. Like, be weirdly fixated on how the thumbtacks work. Mm. Yeah. It's cool. I like it. Stands out. Abyss misses a splash, lands in tax. Sabu then springboard pushes Abyss into the tax. He does, like, a springboard, and it looks like he... he I think maybe it was meant to leg drop him, but there was too much distance. So he stopped and did, like, a double cross-chop push to knock Abyss into the tax. <laughs> Just awesome. Uh, black hole slam onto a barbed wire chair for the win, and there was a ton of blood on Sabu's back, which I'm not sure was from the tax, or was it shoot barbed wire? I'm not sure. Either way, his back looked fucked up. And that's all that matters. The end result. Uh, but yes, uh, Abyss ran away, even even though he won using barbed wire, he was like, Ugh. I still think the first match is better, mm. or maybe stands out a little more, but like, they both kind of rock. <laughs> It's just two guys who are unique. Like, Sabu, again, falls into that category of a dude who is just unlike anything else you see in wrestling. He is a crazy wild man who might fuck up half his spots, but that's like half of his appeal. I thought you were going to call him a crazy white boy. <laughs> Abyss is a crazy white Abyss boy. Abyss is the craziest of white boys. But, like, Sabu is... He's just the wild man. And, like, part of Sabu's appeal... Like, people are like, oh, he might miss his dives. It's like, that's Sabu. Yeah, that owns. <laughs> that's, like, a percent... I know, like, there was the theory that sometimes he'd fuck it up on purpose. Just to, like, magnify his mystique, I guess. I think that's been, like, triple confirmed now from people. It's, like, to, to sell the danger and unpredictability of a Sabu match, sometimes he would just eat shit. <laughs> and it's the kind of thing that's just, like, if you ate shit, you just, like, start spreading that as a rumor. It's like, actually, I do that on purpose to really sell the character. Because <laughs> I think there was, like, some people that would wrestle him and said, like, he would call that mm. to them. He'd be like, I'm going to do the spring bubble and we're going to fuck it up. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it was just really self-detrimental. <laughs> You do have two guys who are unique, distinct, and willing to absolutely kill themselves to have a good hardcore match. So they are absolutely... And again, big man, rel like, so he's not small, but relative to Abyss, he is small. So it's like big man bumping around, small man is always like a, a good dynamic. Just to throw him with a spinning choke slam into some thumbtacks and you have a good wrestling match. Better than one and a half stars, Dave Meltzer. Yeah, that's insane. Star and a half. That's disrespectful. Um, I, I was Googling because we were talking about it on the watch along if Abyss and Moxley ever had a match. Mm. They did, but it was a six man. And what a six man this is. On one side, John Moxley, Roger Ruffin and Ryan Stone mm. versus Muldoon. <laughs> A.K.A. Dustin Thomas, which I've heard the name. Chris Harris. Yeah! And Abyss. That's a dream match. When was that? 2007 Ooh. at NWF Aggression. It's a dream match anywhere in the world. Yeah, featuring other big matches like Brian Jennings versus Crybaby oh. with Crazy Courtney. Crybaby's finally gonna get his comeuppance. He's finally gonna be a Crybaby. And, of course... The American Eagle defeating Dr. Melvin Winkleman. Is the American Eagle like a product placement wrestler? <laughs> I don't know. Go buy your American Eagle jeans or whatever. I'm the American Eagle. Wait a minute. The American Eagle, also known as Canadian Player. <laughs> 
uh, he, he covers both. That's actually a great pro wrestling bit. They're like, in America, American Eagle. In Canada, Canadian player. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> Who else do we have on this card? We have Austin Midler, Ice, and Stewie Buckland defeating the Warlock and the Zodiacs. So many wrestling names. We have Christo- Christopher Michael Lotus going to a no contest for the NWF United of- Unified title against Benjamin Kimura. So many names. Inji and the Thugs, Nasty Russ and T-Money defeated the Hippies, Jesse Hyde and Pompano Joe. Again, names everywhere. We're doing names all over the place. Chad Allegra defeats Anthony Bryant. Chad Allegra is... Carl Anderson. Anderson, yeah. I was like, I know that name. That's that's Chad Too Bad. Wow, what a show. (laughs) A young Carl Anderson and a young John Moxley with Chris Harris and Abyss on top. Imagine if it was Moxley and... (laughs) Chad Allegra <laughs> against Harris and Abyss. Abyss and, and, and Chris Harris. Tremendous match. They didn't know what they had in that. Where was that indie? I'm going to guess it's Kentucky indie. Uh, it was Ohio. NWF. It's Moxley in 2007. You think he's getting far out of out of Ohio? Kentucky is not very far out of Ohio. <laughs> Ohio. What do you think? What's the last Carl Anderson match that you remember? <laughs> that I remember? Yeah. The, the G1 I saw final in 2012? <laughs> It's the most recent one. <laughs> That's the last one. I'm like, it's a good Carl Anderson match, huh? Um, oh, I never said good. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. I'm kind of sad that Carl seemed to just give up. But he just wrestled on the WWE Super Show. Like, in fairness, he gave up because he's making more money than he's ever made, so he doesn't need to try. So all power to him, yeah. but it's a shame. Seems to be, like, only doing live shows. Yeah, they're doing... Because, like, they're on TV. Because, like, they were only doing live events while AJ was injured. And now AJ's back, mm-hmm. and they're still doing the the OC. Is that the name of their t- stable? Yeah. With Mia Yim as well? Like, they're, they're still on but, TV, like, but they're not they're wrestling. They're not on TV. Yeah, like, their last... TV match was about a month ago. Because I know they were in a, a backstage uh, segment with AJ recently when he was being like, I'm going to wrestle Solo Sokao, and then they were there being like, you shouldn't do that. But it's like, I'm going to do it. AJ Styles, house that and, I built. And now that AJ, and AJ's doing like a, oh, we gotta get our shit together, the OC. So you can do a big OC against Bloodline and or the other one, Judgment Day feud. I think, I think they're doing all of them against each other right now. Honestly, could do worse things than Stable Wars. Yeah, but the OC is just the shitest shite. That's Mia Yim. Yeah. Mia Yim would have a good match at Rhea Ripley. Yeah, you know what? But the Bloodline doesn't have anyone that they can throw into sexist that. Sexist women. No, sexist Bloodline. God damn it. Yeah, what, Bloodline, they don't have The Rock's shitty daughter. Get her up. Call her up. Or Tamina. <laughs> Yeah, Kevin Owens would be so happy. <laughs> yeah, why doesn't the bloodline have any female representation? That's a good question. That's kind of that's kind of fucked up. 